Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Hello, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce Matt Welsh. Uh, Matt is an uh, associate professor in the computer science department of Harvard. Uh, Matt has been working on many different aspects of distributed systems, operating systems, programming language, and so on. And in the recent past, he has been very active in the SensorNet community. And today, he will talk about the stuff that he has been working in this area recently. Great. Thanks for having me. OK, so since this is a very small group, we can keep it highly interactive, which will be fun. So feel free to let me have it. But let me get through a couple slides before you let me have it, because like some people like to jump down my throat on slide two, and then it's, it's, it's too early. OK, so you all know what sensor networks are. I don't have to convince you of this, but just the refresher of small, low-power devices with you know, limited amounts of computation, communication, sensing capability. Um, there's been a lot of interesting platforms developed to do this, so this is kind of exciting. Um, uh, now, the applications that have been developed for sensor nets over the last decade or so are fairly diverse. There's been groups doing uh, monitoring redwood forests. Uh, there's a group at Princeton that's put these on zebras and tracked their, the, the, the herds in, in the African savanna. Uh, there's a group at Vanderbilt that's placed uh, microphones throughout a city and been able to localize sniper fire uh, in real time. This is, this, oh, well, it, I think they actually tested it. It was designed to work in a city, and they tested it at an army training facility or something like that. Um, but it's an urban combat you know, training facility. Uh, the same group at Berkeley has also placed them across the Golden Gate Bridge to monitor vibrations. Um, we've done work on volcanoes, and we've also done work on emergency medical care. Okay, So lots of exciting applications. Now, in all these cases, the key challenge is managing resources, because the individual devices are very resource constrained. They have about 8 megahertz CPUs, tens of kilobytes of memory, uh, very limited radio bandwidth, and tiny batteries, generally. And so my claim is that these resource constraints mean that we really need a completely new approach to software design. We need to rethink the way we design software centered around resource management. And that involves both managing resources at the node level, um, adaptation at, at a, you know, the, the, the need for the application to change what it's doing over time, and managing resources at the network level. Okay, So my mantra here is what I call resource-aware programming, which is make resources a first-class primitive in the programming model so that the programmer is always reasoning about the resource use that the application is requiring. Okay, And I'm going to show you how we've kind of developed that into a system design. OK? So um, I'll talk about a couple of the applications we've developed, the challenges, and then I'm going to talk about two systems. First is Pixie, which is an operating system for sensor nodes that enables this resource-aware programming concept. I'll talk about Lance, which is a framework for managing resources across an entire sensor network, and then I'll wrap it up. So um, the first application that we've worked on extensively is using wireless sensors for volcano monitoring. Have all of you seen? something on this before. I, I think this should be somewhat familiar to you. So the idea is that we've placed um, seismic and acoustic sensors across a volcano. We have a single GPS receiver that establishes a time synchronization uh, for the whole network. We have a long distance radio modems that enable um, uh, uh, connectivity to an observatory which is at a safe distance from the volcano itself. Um, so the cartoon version is the volcano does something interesting. This happens tens to hundreds of times a day on the volcanoes we've worked at. Um, the sensors would record the seismic and acoustic signal associated with the event, route the data back over a multi-hop spanning tree to a base station, and then when you're done with this process, you get a picture that looks like this. And this is time, and each of the colored traces is one of the signals from one of the sensor nodes. And a seismologist would look at this and say, OK, that's an interesting little volcano tectonic earthquake. OK? Um, so we've done deploy three sensor network deployments on two different volcanoes in Ecuador. Yes? What else do they do with it besides just looking at There's it? There's a lot of stuff. The, 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 I'm doing this kind of quickly, but the high level is they are trying to understand the physical processes going on inside the volcano that lead to deformation, to 
eruptions to earthquakes to rock falls to lava flow, everything that volcanoes do, they're basically using these signals to understand the, the, the pressures and the movements inside the volcano. So there's a lot of things they do with it, right? But basic data collection is kind of the key challenge, okay? So, yes, it's important to know where they are physically so that you can do the analysis of the data. There's only one GPS receiver and it provides a time base and we use a multi-hop time sync protocol. When we install the sensors in the ground, we use a handheld GPS to mark the location. Okay, so here's a picture of one of our deployments. Um, uh, uh, this is Conrad Lawrence, one of my former PhD students. Uh, and um, what you see here is the radio antennas. This is the GPS receiver and this is the radio modem. And this is just one of the sensor nodes. And the rest of the sensor nodes are strung up in a line along the volcano. So they're quite far from each other, in fact. They, in fact, um, this, this here is the antenna for the next node in the network, which is several hundred meters away, OK? And um, what he's installing there is a sensor node that looks like this. And this is the moat and the radio, uh, I, I'm sorry, the moat and the radio antenna. And this is our ADC card. And there's D-cell batteries powering it, OK? What this is replacing is a monitoring station that looks like this that the seismologist would typically use. And this has two car batteries inside of it and a data logger. And you know this is extremely heavy, very bulky, lots of power, and would take maybe four to five people to get all the equipment for a single station to the site. Whereas with our design, a single one person can carry like eight of these in a backpack. OK. Yes? Um, do you, you said you had solar power for the big stations. Do you have solar power for the little nodes, too? Not yet, but we're working on that right now. It seems like that changes your power assumptions a lot when you have it, an it, unlimited supply. It's not really unlimited, though. That's the problem, is that... Unlimited power, but not limited, unlimited, unlimited energy, right? Well, the problem is, the, so the solar, the solar panels charge up a battery, but at night, for example, the volcano doesn't know whether it's day or night, so it, it's, op, it's active all the time. So the battery, you would still need a really large battery to power the whole thing sort of continuously overnight, I mean, even with solar charging. You power continuously for days, right? What's that? Without solar panels, you power continuously for days, right? With, with yeah, with D-cell batteries, yeah. Right. Okay, so... Um, the other application, and this is one that drives the power consumption even further, is the use of wearable sensors for um, monitoring limb movements in patients being treated for neuromotor diseases like Parkinson's disease. So we're working with the group at the Spalding Rehab Hospital in Boston on this. This is the sensor note here. Basically, it's the size of a Zippo lighter. Um, it has a triaxial accelerometer, triaxial gyroscope, a little rechargeable battery. It actually has two gigabytes of micro SD flash on there, which is fantastic, so we can log all the signal. And the idea is that the patient wears um, you know, eight to 10 of these on different body segments continuously for several weeks. And uh, they record the movements of the limbs. And the data is collected from them and processed and then used to understand the progression of the disease. Okay, So I could give you a whole talk on how the sensor data is used for understanding Parkinson's disease. But Basically, it comes down to understanding whether the patient is under undergoing normal versus abnormal movements. Does this make sense? OK. So, um, so the things that I want you to notice about the two applications, the first is that the data rates are fairly high, at least for sensor network people. You know, typical sensor networks are designed to support you know, sampling once every 10 minutes or something like that. Now we're sampling multiple channels of data at 100 hertz per channel on each of the nodes. Um, the timing accuracy is very important so that we can compare signals across nodes. Um, the processing of the signals is domain specific in the sense that um, you know, it's the seismologist that's going to study the you know, P wave arrivals of the seismic waves, or it's going to be a clinician that studies the limb movements using classification algorithms. I don't want to write that code. Yeah? Um, and then finally, the, the applications really do have to adapt their behavior based on the uh, changing resource availability. So if the um, wearable sensors are being, if they're being worn by someone and the radio link bandwidth is changing over time, that's going to affect, you know, what data they transmit and when and how. And likewise, if you've got solar pow powered sensor nodes, you've got to tune the processing and the overheads based on how much energy you've got in the battery. Okay? 
So, and that adaptation is also highly application specific because it depends on the application what's important and what's not. Okay? So, um, the standard approach to doing this kind of resource tuning is um, uh, very meticulous and very painful, in my opinion. So, um, this is a tiny OS application uh, for um, the limb movement application that I described earlier. And I don't want you to worry so much about what's inside of each of the boxes, but I want you to notice that basically the application consists of a bunch of software components with fairly complex wirings between them. And the other thing is that inside of each of these boxes, there tends to be one or more uh, knobs that one can tune to change the uh, overhead and the fidelity and the resource consumption of that box. So, for example, I could change the interval at which I uh, uh, do the LPL checks on the radio MAC layer. I can change the processing rate of the data. I can change the refresh rate of the flooding protocol. And so there's a gazillion knobs scattered throughout the software that affect the quality of the data and the resource consumption. So my belief is that a domain scientist especially is not going to want to think about it this way. And this is a lot like sitting at the cockpit of a 747 where you're um, having to, you know, fiddle with all these knobs and controls in order to get the thing to fly. What's that? Sorry. Yeah, right. So some people like doing this, but I would argue that a, a volcanologist shouldn't be handed this and said, okay, here you go. So what we really want is something like this, <laughs> right? Which gives you several degrees of freedom, but it's much easier to sort of reason about. Yeah. These hundred control knobs look to me very much like what they use for cheating on benchmarks. I'm sure that's not the issue here, but... When yeah, we're, not, we're trying to avoid using them to cheat on benchmarks as well. That's right. But that's right. That's what you do with the but the point is, in this, in this regime, tuning the application to get the right data quality and resource consumption under varying conditions is very hard. All right. So we'd like to provide a programming interface that makes this much more straightforward. So here's what we've done. We've designed a new OS called Pixie. This is um, a sensor node operating system that has this resources as a first class programming primitive. So I would argue in most operating systems, resources are, in some sense, implicit. So, you know, the only place in, say, Unix that you really reason about resource availability is when you call malloc. And if malloc returns null, right? And of course, if malloc returns null, then you have to crash or something. I mean, there's very little you can do in most cases. So, um, the, the point is that in conventional operating systems, they are designed to, sh uh, to shield the application from having to think about resources at all. Because the OS says, well, look, the o application can do whatever it wants, and it's my job as the OS to sort of allow it to do that and to play this shell game to try to make it happen. I'm going to argue with the severe resource constraints on sensor nodes, you can't get away with that anymore. Okay? That virtualizing away the resource constraints is not practical. Yeah? So modern OSs do, vir do uh, abstract away things like uh, the virtual memory system. So you can right. get into a regime where you thrash. Is this going to help? What that's what I'm arguing, is that that's exactly what you don't want. So virtualizing away resources is bad. So would these techniques also you work in regular operating systems? It potentially, yes. Yes, absolutely. But I'm going to argue that it's less important to do that in conventional systems because we have usually plentiful resource. I'm going to argue in a sensor node context, we usually have scarce resource. And so 90% of the time, resources are scarce. You have to really think about rationing them out versus 90% of the time, they work just fine. So virtualization is probably the right approach. So the argument is, and I'm going to talk about the design in a minute, basically the application must contend with varying resource conditions, that you can't hide it away. And the fundamental challenge is how do you allow app programmers to deal with this without too much pain? All right, so here's the design. Here's an application in Pixie. This is that motion analysis application for wearable sensors that I mentioned earlier. Again, it's somewhat simplified in the picture. Um, and basically what we're doing here is we're sampling the sensors, we're looking at the data. If it's not interesting, we drop it. So if the sensor's like not moving, for example. Otherwise, we log the data to flash and we pass the signals to several feature extractors that compute different features on the raw signal and then transmit them over a radio link to the base station. Again, I'm simplifying the hell out of this, but this is just to make it um, a nice picture, okay? So each of these little boxes we call a stage and there's queues in front of the stages that are optional. So I would typically only put a queue in front of a stage that has a variable amount of time to execute, for example, accessing an I.O. device. Now, um, here's how resource management works in Pixie. Let's say that this stage wants to perform some computation on the input signal. 
In order to do that, it has to request energy from the OS because you don't get anything for free in Pixie. All right? You have to get permission to use the energy to do the computation. So it would make a request to the Pixie energy allocator saying, I would like to use 700 millijoules over the next 10 seconds, for example. Then if the energy was available in the battery, it would receive what we call a resource ticket, which is a time-bounded right to consume some amount of energy. Yes? How does it make the request if it doesn't have permission to consume energy? Uh, no, no, no. It's a very good question. So we do give you some amount of energy for free. That is the ability to negotiate these things you get. And that's, there is some overhead for that, but it's a margin, tiny amount of overhead, so it doesn't matter. Okay? That's a good point. Um, it would get the ticket, and then when it wants to perform the computation, it would redeem the ticket by passing it back to the OS and then being able to perform the computation. Okay? So the OS can track how much resource it's promised to different modules in the system, and it can track how much resource is being used. Yes? I think I'm looking at this the wrong way because when I, when I see you passing the tickets back and forth, those look like security tickets, like in case somebody is cheating. That's not what you're worried about. Here. We're not worried about cheating. This is really, we, we trust the application not to, I mean, so, we could make them unforgeable and all that. But right, it's right, sort right. Of that's not your goal. So I'm, I'm trying to understand the, the, what role the tickets provide for the programmer. They're, they're, are they helping the programmer? I mean, is the idea that the ticket is now this, it's a data structure that you can pass around to keep track of what? Yes, so okay, let me sure. come to that. It will become clear in the next slide or two, okay? But you're asking exactly the right question. So um, now, let's say I want to transmit some data, so I need a bandwidth ticket. And so I, I, ask, I say I want to transmit a couple packets over the next few seconds. I get back the bandwidth ticket, and here's what I do. I attach the ticket to the packet that I want to transmit. I pass both the ticket and the packet to the radio link layer. The radio link layer can redeem the ticket and transmit the data. So. The one thing that tickets do is they decouple the request from the use. And so I can accumulate tickets in advance of my needing them. And then I can redeem them later. And I can pass tickets to different parts of the application to allow them to use resource. The key idea here is that in ordinary operating systems, in ordinary programs, you have to reason about how many resources you use in the call site that's responsible for spending the resource, where here you can propagate it back to the call site that's eventually responsible for it, that's and right. then track that use to make sure it's, it, that, that you've actually accounted for it all the way through the point where you're spending it. That's exactly right. And I think the other thing that's important here is that um, um, you know, the site that's using the resources can be different than the site that's requesting it. And that's very important because in, in typical OSs, you're, you sort of are requesting resource and using it kind of at the same time, and we can't decouple those two things, and so I can't allow you to do planning. Then you're basically pushing the knobs that matter all the way upstream to the guy who's turning some sort Potential, of Yeah, so let me come to that in a moment. Where, where the knobs are getting turned is, is the next step in this. Yes? Uh, there's an implicit assumption that you want to transmit the stuff sometime. You don't That's care if you're early or late. If you want to launch an ICM well, at within, within the time window that I'm requesting. Mm -hmm. So the, the, there's an, What happens if a bunch of tickets hit the radio link and uh, it runs out of bandwidth? I'm going to come to that in a moment. This is not a guarantee, is the short this is version of the answer. Totally <laughs> yeah. So I'm concerned that the uh, 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 novice programmer will find it easiest to just ask for the tickets right before he needs That's them. correct, and that's typically what happens. But you don't typically get good behavior when that happens. Let me come to this in okay. a moment. You're asking good questions, so I, 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 have a, I, I believe I'm going to address them all in a moment. So a ticket is a revocable right, and this is important, and I'll talk about that in a moment, to consume some amount of resource until the expiry time. So you can think of it like a short-term reservation for some resource. Um, we can define a simple algebra on these tickets. I can redeem a ticket. I can forfeit a ticket if I don't need it. That tells the OS I don't plan to use the resource. The ticket can be revoked, so the OS can say, I'm sorry, but that ticket's no longer valid. That's good feedback to the application that it needs to change what it's doing. The, we can combine tickets, and I can split them. So typically, an application would hoard or request some number of tickets, combine them into a single larger ticket, and then when it needs to use some resource, it would split the ticket and just peel off the part that it needs and redeem it. Okay. So um, the granularity of a ticket depends on the resource that we're talking about. So an example of bandwidth might fluctuate very rapidly. So the expiry time on a bandwidth ticket should be typically quite short. But to go and ask for, say, energy or storage on the flash, I can have a long expiry time because it's not going anywhere if I'm not using it. So the way of thinking about tickets, it's not a guarantee. It's very difficult to make strict guarantees in these kinds of systems, and so we're trying to move away from that. I don't want to do the kind of 
um, you know, hard real-time OS type guarantee because I think that's too strong. And it's not that useful in these kind of applications. And so in Pixie, a ticket is revocable by the OS even before the expiry time. So you can think of the expiry time of a ticket as a hint. But there's no guarantees. So here's the mental model you should have for a ticket, which is this kind of ticket, an airline ticket. Because an airline ticket by no means gives you the right to get on that airplane, <laughs> right? At best, it gives you the right to go through security and to attempt to get on that airplane. But the airplane may not be there. It may be broken. It may be delayed, OK? And so the airlines have, and it may be overbooked. There's all kinds of things that can happen. And so this is a good mental model that most of the time you're going to get on the airplane with a ticket. But sometimes things are going to not, not happen that way, OK? Um, so this is a very important, but I think that this provides a useful programming abstraction in the sense that it sort of trades off ease of use for efficiency. Okay, we can't guarantee things forever, so we do our best to give you good indication of what you're going to be able to get. So um, in Pixie, every physical resource, energy, bandwidth, storage, and memory has a corresponding physical allocator that's responsible for handing out tickets. And the key thing about an allocator in Pixie is that it's policy free. If you make a request for a ticket, it will give you the ticket as long as the resource is available. It does not impose any kind of policy. There's no prioritization. There's no preferences. There's no scheduling. It's just give me what's available right now. And I'll talk in a moment about how we impose policy on top of that. Yes? The contract with the scheduler is more like a yes or no thing that I request for a ticket and you get yes, you get it or no. Essentially, I was wondering if you want to make it, you said resource away, right? So essentially, can you not pass hints back essentially saying, look, this much is the bandwidth available? That's exactly what happened. So you can, you can optionally, you can say, give me a ticket and optionally can say, look, I can't give it to you, but here's how much I do have. Because that's usually what you want to find out. Otherwise, the application would be forced to do like a search <laughs> and keep asking for a smaller and smaller and smaller amount until it gets what's available, which is not what you want to do. So what we just do is when you don't get a ticket, we tell you, we're not giving it to you, but here's how much we do have. There's also a notion of essentially like the, the order or essentially the serialization of how you redeem the tickets, right? Because I guess that was the earlier question too, that now you can come and essentially stop, you know, I don't know if this is, you know, even the, within a single, um, single application if you have multiple components, right? So one may actually now starve the other, other components. That's exactly right. So there's nothing in, that I've told you so far that would prevent a single component from being greedy and starving others, okay? So, yes? Terminology, when you say right. available, you mean uh, and not already reserved? That's or? correct, okay. and not already reserved. Okay. So, so the point is when I've asked that. for a ticket and it gives me a ticket, I'm not going to promise. Well, but that's up to the OS. The OS could oversubscribe over itself. So it could say, look, I, you know, probabilistically speaking, not all the tickets get used, and so I could promise more energy than is really available. But that would be kind of cutting it. We, we, we don't tend to find that that's a useful thing to do. Okay, so um, now the que this is addressing some of the questions that have come up so far. So tickets are actually kind of hard to use, and it's kind of low level, and it's a low level mechanism, and I find it very useful, but people tend not to want to deal with them. So we've introduced this concept of a resource broker that's basically a software module that mediates the ticket um, allocations on behalf of the application. So there's a word called middleware that some of you may have heard, and I don't like that word, so I tend not to use it. But if you've heard that word, you may consider this to be like middleware, OK? Um, basically, a broker is just a high level. It's just a software module, and it has its own separate API. And you can specify you know, what you want, and it will go and get the tickets for you and perform potentially operations on your behalf. So a good example of this is uh, because it's just a stage, it can interpose on the data flow path. So the broker can be responsible for, example, redirecting the data that's flowing through it down several down, downstream paths based on the available resource. Right? So then the application modules don't need to care about tickets at all because the broker is doing that for them. Yeah. So this is just like back before you went and bought your airline tickets directly from the airline. You had to go to a, a travel agent. And you'd say to the travel agent, I want to go to Honolulu. And they'd find you the best deal and whatever. And then they'd deal with all the issuing the tickets. And they'd sort of hand you a dossier and an itinerary. And off you would go. Right? Did you have a question? Did you have a question? I'm really confused. Like, what exactly are tickets kind of buying you here? In the sense, like, I mean, one, I mean, so you want to make applications resource aware. Just a simple primitive that would let applications poll how much resource is available right now. Wouldn't that be enough? Versus, 
I, I'm arguing that's not quite going far enough in the sense that I want to be able to give hints to an application about the future ability to use a resource up to some time limit. Because if I say, well, what's available right now? And then I say, okay, well, right now I'm able to transmit 10, 10 packets. Then I got to go do a whole bunch of work to kind of plan on being able to transmit those 10 packets. But I don't know that another software module hasn't jumped in there and tried to transmit before I got around to it. And so I really do think that we need the concept of a reservation in there so an application can commit some resources to preparing some work that it's going to do that's going to later consume that resource down the line. Does that kind of make sense? Um, in an abstract way, yes. Um, I'm thinking, like, are there applications like that that know that they want to do a certain amount of work ahead of time? A very good example is I don't want to go spend a whole bunch of uh, joules computing a bunch of stuff if I'm not going to be able to transmit the result at the end. So I'd like to know in advance that I want, I'm going to be able to transmit the result. So I want to get the bandwidth ticket, and then I want to go spend some time computing the thing that I'm going to transmit, and then I'll transmit it later on. So that's what I mean by decoupling the request from the usage. It's very important to be able to do that. And typically, the applications are written like to be smart enough to do that, in the sense? Not always, but I want to make it possible. I guess what I'm getting at is, there's going to be a lot of cases that we don't need all this complexity, but I'm trying to come up with what is the fundamental set of primitives that we need in order to manage resources. Yeah? And do multiple applications typically run on these sensor nets? Or no, OK, this is a very good point. So we are assuming throughout this whole thing that there's a single application, or at least that if there's multiple applications, that they're cooperative somehow. Typically, I've never seen a, a viable sensor network that has multiple applications running on it. I mean, no one's talked about that. And, uh, volcano in Ecuador that's covered in zebras. <laughs> the volcano that's covered in zebras. Right. Hmm? Nothing. Okay, so <laughs> let, me, let me keep moving. Let me show you an example of brokers at work. So here's an example where um, these four stages would like to transmit some amount of data, two packets a second, four packets a second, and so forth. But the radio link may not be able to support all of the bandwidth based on the current link conditions. So. Each of these stages could go and request its own tickets, and then they would have to talk to each other and decide who gets to transmit first and second and so forth in order to use the radio link effectively. Rather than do that, we can introduce a bandwidth broker that would receive information from the stages on the nominal transmission rate that they'd like. And then it can request the tickets on behalf of those stages, get it back. And in this case, it asks for 20 packets a second. It only gets 12 packets a second back as a, as a, as a ticket. And it realizes that. It can't satisfy all these needs, so what it can do is split the ticket and hand these stages a subset of the ticket, okay? And the math happened to work out in this case to add up to 12 packets a second. And what that has the effect of doing is disabling the stage because that stage not, is not getting the resource to transmit anything. For 20 rather than 20 plus 6 plus 4. It, it, the reason is, is simply, I didn't, I didn't go through the details, but basically there's a priority scheme here, and if I'm able to send this amount of data, I don't need to send this stuff. So it's basically, this dominates all those guys. So that's the API that... The API uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm grossly simplifying it for the purpose of the presentation, but yes. So I think the thing to think here is that the bandwidth broker is not an abstract thing. It actually has some knowledge about the set of things. That That's correct. And each one of these actually has a priority associated with it. OK, but it's, it's PowerPoint, not code. So I just wanted to kind of make it, make it simple. OK, so the other thing we can do is use this to schedule energy. So I can say, for example, let's say I've got my battery, and there's a lifetime target. And I can define a nominal rate at which I'd like to allocate energy tickets to the application to meet the lifetime target. So then I can have an energy broker that goes and gets energy tickets and hands them to the application to ensure that we meet this rate, right? And so a very simple approach is a conservative strategy that says, make sure that the amount of energy that's left in the battery at each moment in time never falls below this nominal schedule. That will guarantee I meet the lifetime target, but it's conservative. A different approach is to allow the energy to temporarily fall below the schedule. And this is what I call a credit-based scheme. And this allows me to incur some energy debt. And when I do go into debt, then I basically have to pull back on the amount of energy I give out to the application so that it will recoup that debt and go back above the schedule. And then when I'm above the schedule, I can increase the rated energy that energy is allocated. Yes? The real batteries are not exactly that red line. Does that matter? Um, I'm, 
Yeah, it's true. I, for the purpose of the presentation, I'm kind of simplifying the battery model. It turns out we use a very simple battery model and it still works very well. So it's true that real batteries, like especially like alkaline batteries, are especially very sensitive to voltage fluctuations and all kinds of things. You know, we tend to use lithium polymer batteries that have a little bit more of a, a, a simpler model to them. But, you know, battery modeling is a very complex topic. I kind of didn't want to get into it. But you're right. Right now we're kind of using a very simplistic battery model. Sure. It's, it works very well, and so some of it is like, well, I mean, it may end up hurting us by about 10 or 20 percent in the end, but uh, for the most part, being able to do, reason about the energy consumption over time is, gets you most of the way there. But that's a good point. But does your model allow, if you tomorrow came up with a better battery We can model? plug in a better battery model and this all that will work. It would just, this, the shape of this curve would not be so simple. Okay. So uh, let me show you a quick evaluation of this thing. Um, this is an application uh, based on using a network of uh, sensors with microphones to detect acoustic um, events in the environment. And the one that we're looking at is the alarm call of this type of marmot. And the reason is that Lou Gerard has this wonderful rich data set that he's collected out in forests, and so we just wanted to use his data set. It could be anything. It could be detecting gunshots or whatever, but we chose marmot calls because he had the data. And here's the application. Basically, we're sampling the acoustic signal at 24 kilohertz. And here's an example of a marmot call in the, in the uh, time domain. And we drop the signal if there's nothing happening, if it's quiet, so, right? Um, and then there's an energy switch. And basically what this does is it looks at the amount of energy left in the battery. And if there's plentiful energy, it will pass the signal to a very good detector that uses an FFT and ramps up the CPU to 400 megahertz and, and does the full processing. And it's very energy expensive, but it's a very good detector. Otherwise, it can use a, a less good detectors, like the, the simplest one is a threshold detector that just says, as long as the acoustic signal is over some threshold, then assume it's a marmot call. Obviously, there's a lot of false positives, but it's very cheap. Okay? So if I look at this, the marmot call in the frequency domain, you can see it, the marmot call right here. This is the same signal. This is the, the time domain. It's the frequency domain. The threshold detector would trigger on anything that went over some threshold. And this is the FFT detector is going to be able to detect the spectral content of the signal. Yes? It seems like a scientist wouldn't really appreciate having a data set that was generated this way because sometimes it was detected using a one detector. That's right. Set, and they That's don't right. know that. Well, we can tell you when it was detected which detector was in use at the time, and so then they could go back and sort of understand whether that was good or bad. But they don't know when it wasn't detected what detectors were in use. That's correct. So is well, we could, well, we, we could easily tell them that information as well. That's, that's not such a big deal. Not, not really re relevant, but if it's more than one frequency, wouldn't the resonant filter cost only marginally more than a high-pass filter? Uh, yeah, I think... Yeah, I'm trying to remember. We played with different filter designs, and I don't remember exactly what we set, why we settled on this set, but I think it's, this is more of an illustration of the idea that I've got different levels of processing of different fidelity. I, I think your point is very well taken, which is that, yes, I mean, does a scientist want a scientific instrument that's got variable fidelity over time based on energy availability? That's a good question. We could have a healthy debate about it, well, but I'm just taking. Yes, I, in general, yeah. I mean, in general, they're quite, uh, you know, they're quite happy with something that's able okay. to tune itself as long as they can go back later and say why did it behave the way it did. Okay, so here's a here's a um, picture. I'm going to walk you. There's a lot of stuff on the graph, so I'm going to walk you through it step by step. Basically, this is the energy consumption of the node, and it's normalized to a target energy schedule of 40 days. So if we were to hug this black line, we would meet a 40-day battery lifetime target. Okay, and down here, each of the dots represents the detection of a marmot call, including false positives, and the black dots are the ground truth. Those are the true marmot calls. Okay, so the simplest scheme is ignore energy altogether and always run the FFT detector. We'll call that an optimistic policy. And as you can see, it doesn't meet the energy schedule. It uses too much energy, but it's 100% accurate. Okay. Um, uh, a conservative strategy always meets the schedule. It always stays below the black line, but it, it's forced to use these cheaper detectors most of the time, and so it has a lot of false positives. If I use the credit-based scheme, this is kind of interesting. What this allows me to do is occasionally the line goes above the black line, meaning that we are incurring energy debt up to a certain point, and that allows it to use the good uh, uh, FFT detector, so it's much more accurate at some periods, but at other times it has to repay the energy debt 
So, and um, forces it to use the threshold detector. Does this kind of make sense? So the credit-based scheme, the point of it is it allows me to use energy in bursts that might um, temporarily violate the schedule. Just like having a credit card means that you can go buy something that you might not have enough money for in your bank account right now. And that's a good thing. Yeah? All right, so... Um, all right, so how much, I mean, how much time do we have? Because it's almost 11.15, and I know that, do you want to go for another 10 minutes? Or, yeah. I mean, is that okay? I, I can do the second part sort of very quickly if that's okay with you guys. I'll give you the, I'll give you the cart, I, because, I, because I don't, I, I think I'm out of time to do the whole thing. So I'll do it kind of quickly if that's all right, and then you can stop me if you have questions. Okay, so I've talked about managing the node level resource. Let's talk about the network as a whole, okay? And so I'm going to focus on reliable signal collection. So the problem is that the rate at which the sensors can generate data outstrips the capacity of the network to download that data from the network, both because of bandwidth constraints and energy constraints. So typically the bandwidth that we can sample at outstrips the multi-hop bandwidth of these radio links. Um, the other observation is that data differs in value. Not all data is created equally. This is a trace of a seismic signal from one of the volcano monitoring nodes. And a seismologist would look at this and say, well, this is the interesting stuff. That's the volcano doing something that I care about. And everything else is really just noise. So I don't necessarily need to download all the data from all the nodes all the time. I care about the interesting signals first, right? The um, third observation is that data differs substantially in terms of the energy cost to download it from the network. So if I'm downloading data from a node that's one hop away, I might be able to get that signal for, say, 522 millijoules. And if it's from multiple hops away, it's going to cost a lot more, and it's going to be a lower bandwidth. And the reason is that it's passing through multiple intermediate nodes, and we're inter inter interfering with nearby nodes that are overhearing those radio transmissions. Okay? Because uh, you, you obviously don't want to bias it to prefer data from one, right? You have to. Well, well I'm going to come to this. So the question, so this is, this is the optimization problem, okay? So, so what we've done is we've created a system called Lance, which is named after this guy, which is basically a priority-driven data collection system for sensor nets. And the goal is to optimize the quality of the data subject to both the energy and the bandwidth constraints. Okay, and one thing I'm not going to talk about today, but Lance basically allows us to have different policies for driving the data download process to let us target many different optimization metrics, priority maximization, fairness, spatial or temporal data distribution, and so forth. So we can basically, uh, domain scientists can come in and parameterize how this thing works for their needs. Okay, but I'm not going to have time to talk about that, so I'm just, I'm just stating this, but you have to believe me. Okay? So... Basically, here's the design. So I've got my sensor nodes. They're sampling data to what I call an ADU, an application data unit. And that's a chunk of data that is sampled by a node. And, and in our case, a, an ADU might be 60 seconds of data sampled at 100 hertz, and that would be about 18 kilobytes. OK? They, they uh, compute a summary of the ADU that represents a concise representation of what's in the, what's in the ADU and whether it's interesting or not and store and send those summaries to the base station. So the base station is getting these periodic summaries of what the sensor nodes are sampling. And then they log the data to flash. Then the base station takes the summaries in, scores the ADU, each ADU, according to a scoring function, which I'll describe in a minute, and then downloads the top scoring ADU from the network. Okay? So it all comes down to the scoring function, how we decide which ADU to download next. Okay? So um, the first thing we need to do to make this meaningful is we need to have some definition of the value of data. And coming back to my original trace here, um, one way to define the value of the data very easily is, uh, in, in this, at least in volcanology, is something called the reduced seismic amplitude measurement, or RSAM, which is basically just taking the average of the signal amplitude over some time window. So if I look at the signal here, I compute the RSAM, the RSAM is just the envelope of the signal here. And this is very, very low bit weight because I actually only compute this for every 60 second time window. Right? This is multiple hours of data. That's why it looks like a lot here. Okay? Now, the definition of the data value is going to be very application dependent. So that's where we let the domain scientists plug in a function. 
Okay? The assumption that we make is that computing this can be done efficiently on the sensor nodes themselves. Okay? So it may be crude and it may not always be exactly what you want, but it's very efficient to compute it on the nodes. Yeah. <coughs> what radio energy model do you assume? Like I'm coming to that in a moment. I have a, a whole slide on that. Okay? So um, the optimization goal is as follows. If I define the universe of all the possible ADUs that are sampled by the network, and then I have a vector of the energy capacity of each node, then, uh, and I define both the cost and the value for each ADU, and the cost is a vector of the energy consumption across a set of nodes that are responsible for downloading the data. I'll show that in a moment. Then the optimal set is the set of ADUs that maximize the sum of their value subject to the sum of the cost being less than the energy capacity of the nodes. Right? And so this is just a multi-dimensional knapsack problem. The dimensions of the knapsack are the energy capacities of the nodes, and the values of the objects you're sticking into the knapsack is the value of the ADU, and the cost of each object is the vector of the energy consumption to download that ADU. Okay? So we know how to do this in an offline way, and so I can compute the optimal set. But I can only do that sort of knowing all the future ADUs that are sampled by the network. So what we need is an online greedy approximation to this. So here's what we've done. Basically, as we learn about an ADU sampled by the network, we assign a score to it. And I'll talk about the scoring functions next. And then I exclude the data stored on nodes that currently do not have enough energy. So this is a local greedy thing. It says, uh, just like I showed before, that I have the slope. And if a node has fallen below that slope, I just consider it to be offline temporarily. So I don't try to download data from nodes that are being impacted from an energy point of view. And then I download the remaining ADU with the highest score. This is a very, very simple heuristic. I'm going to show you that it works incredibly well, though. So that's the advantage. OK, so um, here's the energy. You're asking about the energy cost for, the, for downloading. So um, let's say that I've got this AD, an ADU stored here, and I want to download it. Well, there's three costs involved. First, the energy drain on the node that I'm downloading from. And we've measured these empirically, so it's 58 millijoules per second. The energy drain of the nodes that are forwarding the packets, and that's about 55 millijoules per second. And then the other thing we have to consider is, as these nodes are transmitting packets, other nodes nearby are going to overhear those packets, and that's going to consume slightly more energy on them. Yeah? And so that's what we call the overhearing cost, and that turns out to be about 6 millijoules per second. Okay? So we can model this pretty well. Um, uh, and then, so here's the scoring. This is the key, is the scoring function. So um, if I have uh, a set of ADUs, and let's say that I've got an ADU with value 10 and a cost vector here, which is downloading from this node plus the overhearing cost plus the, you know, this is the cost at each of the sensor nodes. Um, uh, so I can define three ADUs, and each one has a corresponding cost vector, okay? I've got three possible scoring functions that we've looked at. The first is just to consider the value. Ignore the cost and just say that the highest valued ADU is the highest valued thing, okay? Yeah? The second one can weight the value of the ADU by the total cost. So I would sum up the elements of the vector and divide that by the value, and that would give me the score. Yeah? Turns out that that doesn't work so well because it prefers only um, ADUs at nodes that are close to the base station because the further you are from the base station, the more cost accumulates to download something. So the third scoring function is what we call cost bottleneck. And here's the idea, is I weight the value of the ADU by the energy cost on the node that is the most energy constrained. So I look at the amount of energy available across the set of nodes that are involved, and I divide, so let's say that this is the node that's the most energy constrained, for example, I would divide the value by the cost to that node. That kind of makes sense? Okay. So the intuition is I'm optimizing by looking at who I hurt the most as I'm downloading something, and I scale the value of the ADU by that amount. Okay. So let me show you how this works. So this is, go ahead. Uh, so are you ignoring zeros or not? Uh, what do you mean by that? So if there's another node that has a zero, is yes. that the most, do you sometimes divide by that zero or? Uh, well, we have to, let me see if I can explain this. So 
we're not going to divide by zero, first of all. Indeed, but but that node would not be. It's not affected by this download at all by definition because it's a zero. Right. So it's not considered as part of being. The, it can't possibly be in the bottleneck set. It's only the set of nodes with non-zero. I should have been careful. The set of nodes with non-zero entries in the cost vector are considered to be potential bottlenecks. Then I take a look at all those nodes, figure out who's the bottleneck, then I divide by the energy cost to that node. Because there's not a lot of, I mean, there might be a zero and there might be a 0 0.1, and zero is 0 0.1 insignificant? I mean, is there a threshold? It doesn't seem to happen. I mean, this doesn't because really seem to happen. You're talking about overhearing, which is kind yeah. of minor. Right, it's, it's very cost. small, but it, it's, it's not. It's, but you, but those minor costs are going to yeah. turn into really large denominators. Uh, it, I guess it's conceivably possible that that happens. I can't tell you off the bat whether any of our experiments have seen that effect, as, as the bottleneck nodes happens to be one with a very small energy cost, so therefore the value just explodes on you. But, I mean, it works, even if that is the case. So let me show you that it works. Okay, so this is a simple, um, this is a simulation where we've taken a, 10 nodes in a linear chain, and we're feeding it realistic data, okay? And, um, uh, and then I'm looking at the fraction of the available data from each node that's downloaded, okay? So if this was 100%, that would have meant I downloaded all the data sampled by that node. And if I just use the value, then what you notice is that it downloads the, basically the same amount of data from all the nodes. So this ignores the um, energy cost. If I only consider the cost, then it prefers nodes near the sink because they have lower cost. And this is bad. This is a bias that we would like to avoid. If I use the cost bottleneck function, and then I look at the optimal, this is what's optimal according to the knapsack solution, you can see that they're basically equivalent, that this cost bottleneck function, which is an online greedy heuristic, matches very closely an offline optimal solution to this problem. This, is, I think, is pretty significant. It says that we can make greedy local decisions about what to download from the network, and in the end, it ends up giving us basically the optimal set. Yeah? Still biased, though. I mean, oh, it is biased, but this is optimal. <laughs> right? This is the set of data that we should have downloaded that maximizes the sum of the value subject to the energy constraints. I you just have to be very careful as, as you're interpreting this data not to use the number of samples in your, in your statistical analysis, right? I mean, you, you've now, I mean, I, I guess it depends on your value computation. I guess you made the assumption that you can a priori determine the value with, with high, uh, you know, perfectly. And so That's basically correct. Yeah. Yes? Is this correspondence um, an artifact to some extent of the fact that you're looking at a linear chain topology as opposed to a more... We have looked at this in... Dozens of, I mean, I, I don't know if, if I have the slides here. Yeah, here, here's another one. So here's a, here's a run on an actual test bed of about 100, uh, well, this is a 50 node. We, we, we have 200 nodes test bed. We took 50 of them and we created a spanning tree. So this is a real network running on real moats with real data, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And um, if I look at the optimal, that's the green. And I look at what Lance did, that's the blue. And what you notice is that it closely matches. It's not perfect. So sometimes we download less data from the node than we should, and sometimes we download more data than we should. But if I look at the total value downloaded out of the network, they match almost perfectly. So, you know, uh, you know it's not perfect. I'm not claiming it is, but it's way better than something that just tries to consider either the cost or the value separately. And we've looked at different data distributions. We've looked at real, you know, all kinds of stuff, and it's this, this holds across the, across the spectrum. So how do you uh, get the cost inputs? to the algorithm. How do you, do the, one of the inputs is the cost on... That's, that's right. So the base the, station knows the topology because it's getting heartbeat messages from each of the nodes about who its parents are in the routing tree. And we discover the neighbor set based on other heartbeat information from the nodes. So then, then we use that model that says that the energy cost for downloading or for overhearing or for um, routing data, what I described earlier, and that's applied to the known topology of the network. And so that determines the cost vectors. Okay, so we are using a making a modeling assumption there that we know how much energy is eaten up on a node when it's doing one of those three operations. Okay, um, so to sh test this stuff, we w in the field setting, we went back to the volcano, actually a different volcano this time. We deployed a small network uh, of about eight nodes here 
And um, this is Steve Dawson Haggerty, who's a PhD student of David Cullors now. He was an undergrad at Harvard working with me, and uh, he's setting up one of the nodes. This is my old laptop being used to reprogram one of the nodes because we had a bug in the software, so I had to climb back up the volcano and bring the laptop out and, and, and reprogram the nodes by hand. Don't do this. The MagSafe connector on a Mac has, is magnetic. So is volcanic dust. So cleaning that thing out, because I couldn't plug the power cable back in until I cleaned out all the, all the dust. Yes. So anyway, so we went out. We did this. this so basically, here's the, the lesson of this ends up being um, we spent $10,000 to get a paper accepted in census, right? Because this was a $10,000 deployment. And it took us about a week and a half to do it and to fly to Ecuador with all the equipment and do all the stuff and to deploy the network for only three days and then get the data and then fly back home. So, you know, but it got the paper in, so it was probably worth it in the end. Um, when we went out there, the day before, the volcano was extremely active. It was erupting every hour. There was some very exciting activity. We set up the sensors on the volcano and it went quiet. <laughs> and so we fixed the volcano is what the joke is. And so here is... One of the signals we downloaded, and that's just like a little, little tiny earthquake. It's not even that interesting. Here's another one, right? And, um, and we saw this too, and we said, oh, that's exciting. That looks like real, real interesting data here. Well, no, it turns out this is when we install each sensor node to check that the seismometer is working. I asked the student to stomp the ground five times next to the sensor so I can see the signal, and that's all it is there. Okay, so. Um, Unfortunately, the volcano did not cooperate with us, but the result is basically that Lance did the right thing anyway and ended up downloading 99.5% of the optimal data according to what an offline Oracle solution would have done. Right? So we came home later and analyzed all the data from all the nodes and so forth, and we could tell you that it did the right thing in the field. So, you know, it's unfortunate that the signals were not all that interesting in the end, but that sort of nature did not cooperate with us. That number would vary um, depending on the distribution of the value frames, because in your, in your But the distribution was good enough to see this, that Lance did the right thing. I mean, in some sense, this is pessimistic, because normally what we would have expected was uh, some very exciting earthquake activity punctuated by long periods of dormancy. But in this case, we're having mostly dormancy with a little tiny earthquakes. So what's really nice is that Lance actually did the right thing, even though there wasn't a big difference between the noise and the earthquake signals. Does that make sense? I mean, the opposite way, because if there was a big difference, then wouldn't this number be significantly different? I don't think so. I think it would have been better. I think we would have been more like 99.9% .9 had the earthquakes been much stronger, because Lance would have had an easier time discriminating the earthquakes from the noise. Right? So in some sense, this is a pessimistic answer. In some of these applications, for example, it's not just that how far from the base station you are, but it's also very you know, top, topologically significant location you are in the network. Is that also included in your model? Yeah. All, well, that's just based on the energy model that I showed you earlier of the energy cost to download something. Oh, sorry. Also, essentially, that, um, you know, if for, know, for, for volcanic activity, essentially, if you're core to the center of the core of that activity is versus essentially if you're... Oh, uh, no, 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 no. The way, th this is a good point. No, it turns out that for volcanic activity, it basically impinges on all the nodes simultaneously. And so y you're not really that concerned about which specific sensor node you're getting data from. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, that's a good point. It's not localized activity. It's generalized. Okay, so I'm out of time, but this is... So let me tell two quick slides on, and I'm going to say three sentences on each one in terms of what we're doing next. So I've talked about local node resource management. I've talked about network-wide resource management. The next step of this is to enable sensor nodes to work together to make these decisions in the network in a decentralized fashion so that we don't have to have global coordination, okay? And so for that, we're designing a new distributed OS called Peloton. And this is based on, this is a Peloton of cyclists. And they, the reason they ride close together like this is so that they reduce the wind drag for each other and so they're much more efficient together. Okay, so the idea in Peloton is that it allows sensor nodes to share information with one, with one another and make localized decisions about the resource allocations. Is there more drag if you're not right behind but actually like slightly diagonal? Probably that's true. And, and the other problem with the Peloton is if any one of these guys falls over, the whole thing collapses. So that's the other thing we want to avoid in this system. But the, the point is that it was just meant to, you know, because we've got Lance, so we've got now the Peloton. Okay.
that's probably a different. There's a, there's a slightly different effect, yeah. I think. But anyway, okay. So, so speaking of flying, think, speaking of flying things. So we also just got a large NSF grant to develop uh, basically a robotic colony of of artificial bees, and this is called the ro this is called the Robo Bees Project. You can check this out on my website. Um, basically, we have a prototype flapping wing micro insect that looks like this. It's got um, biomimetic wing design. Um, right now, it doesn't have any onboard computation or sensors, so that's part of the project is going to be to turn this thing into an autonomous vehicle. The other problem is that this, you see this lead here. The, the way this thing gets actuated is it needs to be plugged into a 1.2 kilovolt power supply. So that's probably not so practical for uh, allowing it to be untethered. So there's a lot of interesting challenges in terms of making this thing real. But what my group, we've, the project is broken into the body, the brain, and the colony, and I'm focused on the colony side of it, and in particular providing a swarm operating system to basically allow us to program a whole colony of these things to go do coordinated activities like search and rescue, pollination, environmental monitoring, and so forth. Okay. Um, anyway, so basically that's it. I, I've talked about resource management challenges and sensor nets. I've talked about Pixie to manage resources at the node level and Lance to manage resources at the network level. And uh, there's a lot of stuff on my webpage. So thank you for your time. Okay. Do you have any last questions? Yeah. So I'm also essentially um, yes, looking at the, the time when we said resource we're programming, but there's also notions that when you know, essentially you're, it's not just forwarding information at sense network, you're also trying to correlate something. Some That's correct. Which thing you essentially want to do, right? That's so right. That it, may not, it may be the case that you know, data arrives from a node which is now, which has become unavailable for some short period of time or permanently, right? So because the node capacities or the energy fluctuation, fluctuations would vary. So now in terms of building these applications, it's not, is it just resource awareness? Because I thought, I sort of get the idea that it's more of a, a single node view of resources, but also maybe what you call a network aware of, uh, you know, failure of your programming. Uh, yeah, I, I'm sort of putting that all under the rubric of resource aware programming, but that's just because it's a nice term. But I mean, I think it's exactly right that a lot of the problems that we're concerned with at the network wide level really do concern themselves with like whether a node is online or offline or has enough energy to even provide data to me right now. And so Lance does let us reason about those things. I didn't talk about, there's a bunch of other parts of Lance that let us define policies that can drive the data collection in different ways based on domain science needs. So a good example is if a couple of nodes detect an interesting event, I might want to go download the data from all the nodes in the network simultaneously, even if some of them are reporting low data value because I want to correlate that signal across the entire network. So I can override the kind of default optimization strategy in that case. So that would also give me the, po the power to do some of these other things, which is to account for node failures and so forth. But right. is, it, is it exposed to the, to the developer now? Yeah, all of that is through a Python API, basically. And, and you know, the, the, way I, the way you program an application in Lance is you define this very simple policy module chain that dictates how it should treat the data that's being sampled by the sensor nodes and prioritize what should be downloaded next. And those things can be stateful. They can track you know, what the nodes are doing over time. There's lots of things that they're capable of doing, but just for time, I didn't get into that today. Yeah. So have other people programmed on these platforms yet? No, I mean, that, that's, it's definitely true that, you know, getting the domain scientists to use this stuff is challenging, but they don't program the sensor nodes at all. So, I mean, it's up to us right now to kind of work with them and enable what they need in the future. But, you know, we're, we are in the process, like in the medical, in the, in the, in the uh, Parkinson's monitoring application, I mean, the, the, I'm, I'm in the process of moving that project so that they're the ones dealing with it and doing all the programming and, and we're not going to be in the loop anymore. So the hope is that over the next you know, year that they're going to be able to pick the stuff up and, and tweak it themselves. That's the plan. Right, but we haven't done the user study, so to speak. That's hard. Okay, thanks. <laughs>